Hi, my name is Lizzie Chan, and I'm a member of the CPI Institute's Young Leaders and Alternative Dispute Resolution Steering Committee. I am delighted to host today's episode of the CPI Y80 Corporate Council Interview Series. For those who don't know, the Y80 seeks to educate the next generation of young leaders in the ADR field to educate them about the full spectrum of dispute prevention and resolution mechanisms and to provide an insider's view into how CPS community of in-house counsel, external counsel, academics, neutrals, and other experts in the ADR field are using these mechanisms to manage conflict to enable purpose. And as part of this goal, I've been lucky to speak with in-house counsel and onboards in companies and organizations all around the world about their experiences with ADI and also to share their career advice, especially for those who are looking to move in-house. Today, I am delighted to welcome Elizabeth Linebacker. Hi, Lizzie. Thanks for having me. Hi, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, for those who don't know, is the head of legal of rare diseases and commercial contracts, Europe, Canada at Takeda, and she's based in Switzerland. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks, Lizzie. My first question for you is, can you tell us a bit about your career background, your current role and the types of matters that you're involved in? Sure, and, and thanks for having me today. I'm actually delighted to be part of this interview of uh, Why ADR, uh, because I spent 10 years of my career in arbitration um, in, in law firms. I started um, at Levick of Mancolor in Geneva, and then I moved to Zurich. And a few years ago, I moved in-house, and currently I'm the head of legal in Europe and Canada for the commercialization of rare disease products. And I had another group um, which is responsible for procurement contracts. That is so interesting. Uh, let's uh, look a little more closely at what you do for a company. So how is the legal function organized in your company? Um, so it's hard to give a, a simple answer, but maybe um, to start, you know, I think it's important to say that we are an independent function. You have, for example, other types of function like ethics and compliance. Sometimes they are reporting into business, into the business, and sometimes they are reporting into a chief ethics and compliance that's not tied into the business. For legal, we are completely independent, although my clients are from the business, you know, the franchise heads, the medical um, of certain products. I am not reporting into them. I am reporting into a general counsel. We have a, a global general counsel, um, which is completely independent. Um, and then we have... Um, our group, which is divided into regions. So I'm part of the region Europe and Canada. We have another region, which is Japan, because Takeda is the, the largest Japanese company. So Japan is a, is a region of, of its own. And then we have also country lawyers, which are, who are um, kind of like independent general counsel in their own country. We also have lawyers who are um, specialized um, in a certain area from the headquarters. And so they are a part maybe of a region, but they are more organized based on their expertise. So you would have a M&A and business development, you would have um, corporate affairs, you have privacy, you have IP. Um, and so that's how we are organized. We have geographic regions and we have also uh, specialty areas. It's so interesting to learn more about how the legal function is organized, because really it sounds like there's a law firm even just within your company with you know, people with different specializations and people based in other, in other countries. My next question is about your work for your company on diversity. And I understand that you're part of a focus group within Takeda on that topic. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about your work on that focus group and what your views are on diversity in our profession? Yes, thanks for raising that question, Lizzie, because I think it's really an important topic and we see it more and more in, in all the discussions um, from companies that it, it's becoming really a topic that, that um, has a lot of um, interest. I think uh, we, you know, the company itself is interested in DNI. 
so this is one topic, how you can fit. And, and I think as a legal function, you know, we're also looking at this. So maybe I'll start with, you know, what we do as a global company in, in the area of DNI. We have resource groups, which are like kind of, you know, uh, groups of volunteers on specific topics. I am the chapter lead for women at Tequila in Switzerland. We have a Black Leadership Council who, uh, which focuses on, on ethnicity um, issues. And we have also Tech Pride, which, which promotes also um, inclusive, inclusiveness of all um, kind of uh, gender or sexual orientation matters. In my role as, at Women at Takeda, what we really strive to do is put in place some programs to support um, uh, women advancement and development to retain our talent. So what we did is that we, we just launched it actually in the last year for Switzerland. Uh, we put in place a mentoring program where we have uh, all our senior leaders um, taking on board a mentee, a women mentee. Uh, for one year and having regular one-on-ones with them. That has been extremely successful. So we're going to recontact it um, next year. With um, COVID and, and the work um, at home, we saw also a need to support parents, to have companies really step in and um, provide more support to parents, especially as you know, schools were being closed, daycare was, were being closed. So, and you were here trying to you know, do your work, but also uh, care for your children. So that was a really good opportunity to bring on that topic. Um, so we put in place you know, um, some programs to provide support to parents. That also went hand in hand with the launch of um, parental leave for fathers as well. Um, so now we don't have any differentiation um, in Switzerland in our company for men and women and adoptive parents, which is really great. So women and men, they, they both, when they become parents, they get uh, 16 weeks of parental leave. Um, so I think these are really tangible and concrete actions that the company is, is taking to, um, to really support DNI activities. Now within legal, we also have a DNI diversity, equity, and inclusion group, because we thought, you know, as lawyers, we have kind of a um, natural interest in, you know, fairness, equitable, equitable treatment, and justice, and and the legal group should be really at the forefront of the discussion, and in that sense, you know, we're we're really well placed to support the the activities. And you know to review the policies and and to really um, kind of drive the company to maybe you know to of course um, um, comply with the legal requirements we can which can um, vary from one country to another but maybe we go beyond you know and we we can advise to have some kind of general standards um, so that we are really the, the pioneer. In DNI, and that that the lawyers can really drive the discussion. I'm so excited to hear about the pioneering work that Takeda is doing, in, in terms of DNI in the workplace. And I really like the focus on specific and concrete programs and steps that the company is taking to support like women and men. I was really pleased to hear about the parental leave for men and women. Uh, and in many ways, you know, that's what I'm trying to do uh, within my work as well in international arbitration, being part of arbitral women, for example, uh, whilst we're not, you know, part of a law firm for individual, for our individual members, we try to provide a support network for all of our members. So, for example, we have an arbitral women uh, parental discussion forum where those who are parents or who are interested in being parents or who are just interested in parental issues can come together and and you know talk about any of the parenting issues that are on their mind and that might include for example uh, the the parental responsibilities that you mentioned during COVID-19 um, and, and these support structures are so important and I think one of the issues um, that's really difficult about uh, diversity is there's also like the the diversity problems come from like structural issues in our profession and one thing that we've previously talked about is the impact of the billable hour on diversity, on our, on, you know, our ability to push forward diversity initiatives. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. 
Yes, I, I think, you know, with the billable hours, your performance is also linked to the time you put. Um, and so this is why very quickly, maybe the, you know, the debate can go more into the direction of gender, because maybe, you know, there is an expectation that, you know, as a woman, it, it, it's, it might be more of a struggle. Where I think I actually should not um, focus on the gender because you, you, you would have like two parents and, and it's, just, it's more, you know, a question of, you know, um, thinking of how can you be inclusive when of, of uh, uh, employees who become carer, be, be it because they have uh, someone who is sick in their family or, you know, a parent who is aging or children, so that basically um, you need to have, you know, this, this space where um, the performance is not linked di directly to, um, to the time you put in. Um, because I think where I saw personally the difference is really, you know, when, when, when I became a parent. Before, when I was a young associate, you know, and, and I, I, I had to work a certain um, target of hours or maybe come to the, in the weekend, there was absolutely no difference between me and others. But then when, when I became a parent and when, when one child was sick and I had to stay at home, um, of course I could, but somehow all of the sudden I had one, one full day of uh, lost billable hours that I needed to catch up on. So this is where really the gap starts. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's not only for women, but it's both for men and, we, uh, men and women who become carers. And so I think, you know, because our work is really tied to um, you know, the, the um, intellectual work we do, the qualitative work. Um, I think there could be another way of thinking about how to assess that that is not directly linked to the time we put, because it means that, you know, you need to be there and do the, the hours. Um, and, and maybe, you know, um, a lot of talented people will um, change industry, not because, you know, it means less uh time but maybe because the performance is, is is assessed on a holistic view and not only ours and now i know that of course you know it's it's not that simplistic that also the performance is not only linked to time but there is still you know some kind of of pressure or assessment linked to the to the hours you put into the system i think you raise a really good point <clears throat> and more generally about how we measure performance and it's easy to, uh, to identify a certain factors that are easy to measure, like time is easy to measure, but it's mm -hmm. more difficult to measure um, or to compare the, the quality of the performance as between people. I think we have you know, similar conversations about school and standardized testing, for example, you know, standardized testing on multiple choice questions can be, uh, can be easy to measure, but there might be a question as to whether that's like the most effective way to, to measure performance or intelligence or, or whatever it is. So I think I, I very much like, you know, welcome conversations where we uh, think about what we want um, in terms of performance and we think creatively exactly. um, about how we, how we assess that. And I, as you mentioned, you're a mother and I know you're a mother to three wonderful children. And myself, you know, I am a, I'm a mother to a wonderful eight and a half, uh, eight, eight and a half month old. Um, and I know you, you have a program in your work to support those who are coming back from parental leave. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little more about that. Well, at this stage, we are piloting uh, this program. So it's only with a, with a few members of our legal team. Because we, we noticed that, you know, the process of um, going into parental leave and then what's happening during your parental leave and what, what, how you prepare to come back and how you prepare, how, you know, when once the person is back, is, there is not a standardized process. And so it, it really depends on how skilled your manager will be or how proactive the employee will be. Um, in you know uh, discussing this topic, so we thought um, it would be good to have you know like e-learning modules so that uh, manager and uh, direct reports could you know learn together how to prepare best for this. 
and to have also um, some hours of coaching for the employee and the manager so that you know um, you can discuss um, the offboarding, how to prepare the transition, who will cover for you, um, and so that it's also less stressful for the person who goes on leave. During the parental leave, um, what is the communication? Do you want to be completely off communication? It's fine for certain people, some other people, you know, they, they feel a bit, you know, excluded or cut off and that, that you know, they are not um, part of the team anymore. And so I think it's good to have these kind of discussions to do that. And also when you come back, uh, what are the great projects we could put you on to like motivated? Because if you came back, it means that you are um, committed to your work, you're motivated. So I think it's really a critical moment where the company really needs to think hard, you know, how can I motivate that person? Because if you only give, you know, the second um, rated projects to, to parents coming back, very quickly they will think, you know, uh, you know, on balance, should I prefer to be with my child or and childcare is expensive, so maybe it makes more sense for me to save these co costs and stay at home. But if you if you have great projects, you're the project lead of, of, of the case, um, then, you know, you will be super motivated and give even, you know, the better of yourself um, because it's really your choice to come back. I really love your focus on motivation and also supporting men and women in that transition from, you know, before going on a parental leave, during parental leave and coming back. And I think it's so important to have clear expectations on all sides, both from like the employer's perspective and the employee's perspective, and also to recognize you know, the, the, the multifaceted areas in which support is really important. I think there's also like there is the, the the work side, you know, continuing to maintain connections to your team, but also clients and matters that you're involved in, while still being able to have, uh, you know, that that mental space to really enjoy your parental leave. Um, but also thinking about the emotional aspects, you know, I know for my part that it was actually very challenging to go on parental leave and just facing the prospect of, you know, um, t taking t uh, taking some time to focus on something that wasn't my that wasn't my career um so and I think again with like the return to work helping people to feel like they you know, can be confident going back into the work knowing that they haven't like lost the skills from before but they've got the support to like become familiar with the work environment and work again and then to be staffed on very exciting projects which will continue to motivate them both to be a good parent and to be a great lawyer Yes, I couldn't mm. agree more. I just wanted to pivot a little uh, now to talk a bit about your advice for young lawyers and how they can uh, do well in, in, their, in their respective uh, jobs. And one thing is about communications with the client. So communications with the client are often channeled through the senior associate, the counsel, the partner, and more junior and mid-level members of the team might feel like it's difficult to get visibility with the client so that the client knows who they are. Um, and, you know, I think like a lot of young lawyers know that they need to know the factual record really well. Um, uh, and, and, they, uh, and we often, you know, make our contribution that way. But from the client perspective, I was wondering if you have any tips for junior and mid-level associates to get, to get that uh, visibility with the client. Uh, thank for raising that, that question. I think this is, you know, uh, a really good question because the sooner you get this, you know, um, interaction with the client, the better you will become. I was always quite um, surprised to see that actually the first time in the career where, where really a lawyer maybe, you know, put on, um, you know, at the forefront, it may, may come really late in the career and you have no, no chance to train, you know, like to do the cross-examination or the opening or interview with the witness. Um, and so, and, and that way, you know, at the crucial moment where a lot is at stake, you, you haven't really had a, a chance to, um, to train that skill. So I guess the sooner you start, the better. And this can, you know, start with, um, really joining the calls and maybe introducing yourself during the call so that the client is aware that uh, it's not only the senior associate or partner on the line, 
um, when the team, you know, when you take a new case and the team is presented, that maybe also the junior associate is really does not appear just in the billing in the invoice, but also there is a, a you know a formal way of introducing the whole team. Um, what I try to do is when you know I see that there is a, um, a more more junior associate on the call, and and I am really pleased to see that this happens more and more. Um, I would also try to ask a question at the end, you know, to that person, what do you think, or do you, have we covered everything, or if I had seen that that person has worked on certain sections, I would, you know, make some question um, about that so that this person, you know, has um, an opportunity to to speak and provide feedback. And, and, and I think, you know, this may come from um, the law firm, but I think the clients can also do a lot, you know, in also uh, trying to promote that because if it comes from the clients, you know, I, I, I guess the, the the junior associate on the call has to to answer. I think and I also try to go, client. To <laughs> yes, exactly. And I also try, you know, um, maybe not to put them on the spot, you know, when there is an exchange of email and that person is, you know, uh, in the chain of email, I try to copy this person um, automatically and, and sometimes to also ask questions to, to that person so that, you know, they, they feel they also their, their um, input is also taken into consideration by the client. I think it's great that you've mentioned there's more that law firms and, and the clients can do to provide more opportunities for, you know, more junior members of the team to speak up and to become known. It's also, that's also very important, of course, because like, you know, a, a core, one of our core roles as external counsel is really to understand the client because that is key to providing, you know, relevant and effective advice. So I was wondering, what do you think we can do to increase develop, developmental opportunities for associates to better understand the client? I think one great thing is to do an internship or a secondment um, because then, you know, and, and to do that early in the career, you know, for example, before you get your qualification as an attorney or after, you know, after one year or two years, uh, because then you will be, um, you, you will have a good understanding of how how the in-house work means. And it's also um, beneficial to the law firm because then you also create a long lasting relationship with the, um, with the client. And with that comes, you know, as you mentioned uh, in your previous question, uh, because the client will know that intern or second D, you know, they will, you know, reach out to him or her directly. And that person will have more opportunity to speak up during the calls. Um, so I think, you know, thinking of ways to automatically integrate in development plan a station at the um, client in a company is, is, would be really valuable. I completely agree. I wanted to respond to um, or pick up on a comment that you made earlier in the interview about your internal clients. So what is your advice? for drafting client communications. You know, what do you want associates to know about what happens to client communications that you receive? Like, where does it go next? And what, what kind of advice is most useful for you? I think first is just to acknowledge uh, right away when a request comes in so that, um, you know, just to say, we're taking care of it, we'll answer into, you know, into, uh, in two days um, with some law firm is completely self-evident with some others, you know, they want to prepare first your answer and then answer you. I think uh, for, because we have such busy schedule, it's, it's better that you let us know um, that this is being taken care of and when we can expect an answer. Um, and also clarity and, and um, really um, concrete advice on you know not, not an objective uh, description of the law but I think what's re really helpful is when we have a recommendation a clear recommendation that you know there is option a option B but we, we clearly recommend option a if we go for if you go for option B this is possible but you have this and this um, um, limitations 
so that you know for us it, it's also on beyond um the the law or um what what the law says we also have a, a recommendation in in practical terms and then rather short more rather short than too long and then if we have follow-up uh questions then this can be developed those are really good tips, particularly the first one, you know, it doesn't take much to just respond to the client uh, immediately and, and say when when something, when they can expect something and that's something we can, this is something that we can all put into practice already. Yes, because usually um, you write to the outside consent when something just came up. And so um, when when you have the reinsurance that this will be taken care of, then you can move on to, to something else. And I always appreciate when I have this, you know, quick feedback, I'm on it. Um, when do you, do you need this by? Mm. You mentioned at the beginning of the interview that you uh, used to specialize in arbitration, but that uh, your, your practice has changed since you moved in-house. So what is your advice for those who are looking to move in-house? Maybe do not wait too long, because I think the more senior you go, if you, you know, the, the hard it may be to move and that's I think that's a general thing that's it's it's the 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 market is not as fluid as we would wish it was it was so um you know recruiters of um in in the pharma because it's a highly regulated regulated industry um if you if you look for someone with 10 years experience if you're lucky to be a um lawyer um, in pharma industry in life science then there's no problem to move you know but if you if you're in another industry then it's it's harder to, to make your case so i would you know i would really advise if you have in mind to become in-house is uh, not to wait too long because then you can still um, it's easier i think um, for recruiters that's a really good point. It goes back to your earlier point about client secondments and the usefulness of doing that um, in your career. So you can decide if you want to move in-house. Exactly. My last question for you is, what is your advice for young practitioners in the ADR field? I think it's really to uh, think broad and, and get engaged in activities and volunteering activities outside of your daily job like you're doing so wonderfully and easy with these corporate council discussions, because this will, you know, um, this is where you will um, get the interesting discussion with the outside world. Um, you can also exchange with your peers and get visibility. So um, don't be shy. If you have an idea, go and do it, um, because I think you'll always get uh, um, a lot out of it. Thank you so much for that wonderful advice. And again, for taking the time to participate in today's interview. We really appreciate it, Elizabeth, and we thank our audience for tuning in. Thanks for having me, Lizzie, it was a pleasure. Thank you.